Good evening and welcome to First Presbyterian Church and the closing worship for this Lord's Day. I'm going to go to the shorter catechism question in just a moment, so if you want to get your bulletins out and be ready for that. In the meantime, I, I do want to make a couple of short announcements that have to do with our children's ministry. Uh, it's just been a blessing to have this building uh, behind us finished and be able to use that. We've also uh, been blessed by the fact that uh, we have more and more and more children, and uh, that's great. However, uh, it means that we need more and more volunteers to help with those children. So I think um, Louise was saying this week that she needs 150 individuals to help to fill out the children's ministry, all the activities that they have going on. And most of those don't require a weekly commitment or sometimes even a monthly commitment, but maybe a quarterly commitment. And uh, so we just want to continue to hold that up to you that our children are a precious gift from the Lord. And we're not looking for someone to just babysit. We really want someone who will invest the gospel into the lives of these children, no matter what age they are. So we want to continue to ask you to consider how you might serve in that ministry and bless this church by blessing these children by serving with them. Also, I just want to remind you that recently we opened up this new room down to my right, all the way at the end of the hall on the right, our family room. It's a room designed uh, with audio visual so you can see the services and experience them, particularly if you have uh, children that uh, may need to be in, a, in another room, shall we say. Uh, for a little while. They may be a little unruly, and we want to offer that or any other needs that they may have. Our St. Andrew's Hall continues to be our overflow worship, and we do want to continue to use and to see that as an actual worship space and experience for people. So if you have special needs or kids that uh, you think would be more comfortable, we do have this family room down on the right, and we want to encourage you to use that. Now, would you stand for our catechism question and the scripture reading and our invocation? Our question tonight is, what is the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. Our text tonight for our opening passage is from 1 John chapter 1, beginning with the fifth verse in line with our sermon text tonight from the Gospel of John. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. Let's pray. Father. Thank you for inviting us into this space tonight to praise your holy name and to give thanks for you for all the blessings that you bring into our life and the way that you even turn our sorrows and the darkness in our life into blessings. If we will just seek you out, pray to you and follow you, that is the path you have set for us. And so thank you for that encouragement that you give us in your word tonight. May all that we do as we worship you tonight please you. Uh, may you find in us a people who love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And through that, learn more and more how to love one another. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
I can recall a couple of times over the past 30 plus years when uh, I've been asked to return to my roots to preach. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the couple of times that I've had the uh, experience has been both a great joy and an honor for me and has also been very frightening. Uh, to go back to uh, a place where you grew up uh, and preach, where people know you, they know who you were as a young boy and all the things that you were into uh, can be a bit scary at times. So Evan, I understand uh, what it's like to come back and preach before the, a church where you've grown up, but you are a favorite son of this congregation, being a covenant child here and uh, the parents of Jeannie and Billy English and uh, a student at Westminster Schools, now a teacher uh, at Westminster School, also a graduate of uh, University of Georgia and Reform Theological Seminary. Kim and Evan have been worshiping with us over the past several months and their two children and we are delighted uh, that you're here and we're delighted that you have returned home. A prophet can return to his own home. And we're glad that you're here tonight and excited about what you're going to share with us from God's Word. So welcome and thank you for being willing to do that tonight. As the ushers come forward, let's go for in prayer now. Father, it is true that nothing but the blood cleanses us to our own great peril. If we ever forget that it is that blood that redeems us, that makes us right before you, that it is that blood that provides forgiveness once we have confessed our sins to you. All the other things in the world, while good, are not the blood of your son Jesus, for whom he gave that blood and you sent him to that cross because of your great love for your people. We stand here tonight as recipients of that love, of that forgiveness, of that grace. We also come to you tonight because of Jesus to bring the needs and concerns of the membership of this congregation and friends and family far beyond this congregation before you. We do pray tonight for Julie McDonald who is in the hospital with pneumonia. We pray for Nancy Halverson, recently diagnosed with a form of lymphoma. We pray for her as she begins her treatments this week that you will uh, strengthen her, that those treatments will accomplish everything that the doctors hope that they will and that you will remove all of that cancer from her. We continue to pray, Lord, for many others in our church who are wrestling with um, uh, illness or disease, would you continue, Father, to heal them? Would you meet them in those moments? Moments so oftentimes when they feel alone, maybe even hopeless, that somehow uh, through your revelation to them in your word and in your creation, you will speak truth to them that you love them, that you care for them, that you have not forgotten them, and that you are according to your will in the process of healing them. Father, we thank you for the gifts that this church continues to pour out through its membership. Lord, that we would be good stewards of those resources to continue and to grow the work of the gospel here in Augusta and around the world. So take these gifts tonight that we offer to you, expand them so that your kingdom might also expand. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen.
All right, let's stand and sing together. Good evening. evening. Pastor Mike was talking about being fearful, coming back to your roots. And I can say as a kid growing up in this church, we played hide and seek and every other game up and down the halls. But one place you never, ever went was up in here. That was just totally off limits. Even now, I'm kind of like, am I allowed to be up here? I don't know. Uh, But it is good to to be back and... um, to be able to proclaim God's word uh, to all of us tonight. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 7. we actually got three texts we're going to briefly read, and they all have one thing in common. They help us understand Jesus' statement, I am the light of the world. John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea, so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, The right time for me has not yet come. For you any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast, because for me the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, Where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He's a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast, did Jesus go up to the temple courts 
and begin to teach. Now skip ahead to chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, of, in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. And finally, chapter 9, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Father, as we come before your word tonight, we pray that your light, the light of your word, the light of your son, would pierce through our hearts, through our souls, and to our families, our marriages, our workplaces. And Lord, that you would bring hope, and you would bring healing, and you would bring life through your word, through your spirit, all through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. How many of you like to be judged by other people? Anybody enjoy that? Anybody enjoy being labeled or stereotyped or boxed in by what other people think about you? Oh, you, you drive that kind of car? Oh, you send your kids to that school? Oh, you voted for them? Well, let's be honest. We do it to one another, don't we? We're not just the recipients. Many times we have these preconceptions of others based on one or two little details we know about them. It's not a fun game to be a part of, is it? Well, our Lord Jesus is no different. There has never been a more judged, stereotyped, labeled, misunderstood person in the history of the world than our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone has their own opinion about who Jesus Christ is. Over the last few weeks, I've had my seventh graders do a little project. They had to go to some public location in Augusta and do a simple little four-question survey. Some of them went to Augusta Mall. Some went to the Augusta University campus. Some of them went to Target. Some of them went to Cabela's. They went all over the place. One of the questions, who do you say Jesus is? Some people said he's the son of God. Some people said he's my savior and he's my Lord. Other people said he's a man with very high morals who lived 2,000 years ago. Others said he's a prophet who started a crazy movement. One person said Jesus is everything and everybody. One person said Jesus is dead. 
This is the places we go every day. Augusta, Georgia. Who is Jesus? Everyone's got their own opinion. But if you ever dig into the Gospels, you realize this everyone come up with who they say Jesus is idea didn't start once Jesus ascended back up into heaven and Christianity started to grow. This conversation was going on while Jesus was on earth. Chapter 7 that we just read earlier, if you actually go back and read the whole chapter, it's one long debate and one long banter with one question at the center of it. Who is Jesus? We saw in verse 12, there was much muttering about him among the people. Some said he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. There's a reason why Jesus is so particular when you actually look at his teachings to say over and over again, I am blank. I am this. I am that. There's a reason why Jesus is constantly defining himself. He knows the gossip. He knows the hearsay. He knows the opinions. Seven different times in John's gospel, Jesus makes an I am statement. You know most of them. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. We're going to look at one tonight. Not who do you say Jesus is, or who does Augusta say Jesus is, but who does Jesus say Jesus is? The one we'll look at tonight is I am the light of the world. Now what's interesting in all of these I am statements that Jesus makes is every single one of them has a context. There's some kind of event, some kind of miracle, some kind of situation going on that Jesus makes this point in the midst of. I like to think of it like a children's sermon. You ever been to a church that does children's sermons? They call all the little kids down and they have some kind of little object lesson. Imagine Jesus, the pastor, and his sermon that week is, I'm the light of the world. And he, okay, children, y'all can come on down to the front. And if we have a blind person among us, if they would also please walk down at this point. He heals the blind and proclaims, I'm the light of the world. You want to guess what miracle he performs when he says, I'm the bread of life? Feeding 5,000. I am the resurrection and the life. He says it at a funeral service of one of his best friends, Lazarus. He gives us these contexts that provide so much more meaning and understanding of what do these little phrases mean. I am the light of the world actually has three events, three encounters, three situations, and all three of them provide so much meaning of what does this phrase mean? We all know it, we've all said it, I'm the light of the world. The first we're going to look at is the feast going on at this time. The feast of booze, the feast of tabernacles. The second is the adulterous woman being dragged before Jesus. And third, him healing the blind man. The first one we'll look at, the feast of tabernacles. This is what we were reading about in John chapter 7. This feast was a big deal. The Jews had three important holidays of their year. Y'all know about Passover. This was another biggie. It was so big that everyone travels down to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booze. I mean, even his brothers are like, Jesus, aren't you coming? Everyone goes. What's interesting about this feast and this festival, this holiday, is it had a very important historical context. It was a week-long event in which they remembered how God had been faithful to his people those 40 years in the wilderness after they came up out of Egypt. If you remember, as they wandered through the desert, they all lived in tents. Even God himself made himself a tent, didn't he? Called the tabernacle, where he lived right there in their midst. And so what people would do to remember this time period is kind of like we do at Christmas. They had all this stuff stored in their basements. They'd pull it out, and they'd set up tents or booze right outside their house for this week. And they'd eat out there. Some people would even live out there for that week. Just to, what was it like for them? You know, we do this in America with our holidays. Thanksgiving. We think about the historical reason why we celebrate this. We think pilgrims and Indians. We put ourselves in their place. July 4th, we think of 1776. It's no different for the Jews here. There was a context about this holiday. But the other thing they did besides set up booze to remember this feast is at the temple that week, they set up these humongous candelabras all over the temple courts. They set up so many candles and so many lights, it literally lit up Jerusalem at night. It was one of people's favorite things to do 
on these vacations, these festivals down. I can't wait till nighttime, see what the temple's gonna look like. Light everywhere. And the reason they did this was because during these 40 years when God pitched his tent in the middle of all their other tents, how did God come down to dwell in his tent, the tabernacle? Do you remember? It was a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And so it was a way in which they remembered how God had been light to his people in the Old Testament. It was a way in which they remembered how that pillar of fire had led them for 40 years. Now, light isn't that big of a deal to us, right? I mean, you want some light at night, all you got to do is flick your finger and you got light. It's a whole different context for them, right? Think about what light meant for them. Two major things I want you to see for God's people in the Old Testament. First, this pillar of fire served as a guide to lead them. For as a guide to lead them. Exodus chapter 13 says, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, and they, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. What did the light do? Every day, 40 years, showed them where to go. It gave them direction. It guided them. If that pillar of fire moved, you followed wherever it went. It's in the midst of this festival and feast, actually the day they start taking down these lights, that Jesus comes right to the temple courts and proclaims, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of light. I am the pillar of fire. I am the God who led my people up out of Egypt. I am the God who guided them to safety, to the promised land. You know, when you think about what it did for them, it was leading them out of slavery and bondage into promise. What does Jesus as our light do? He guides and leads us out of slavery and bondage into promise, into life. We all know this is a major theme of our Old Testament. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. We all understand the passages that talk about light versus darkness, but I want you to think at what's at stake here. What's at stake to follow that light? Just think about the eastern coast of the United States of America. There's hundreds of them all up and down our coastline. Lighthouses. Why are those lighthouses there? Because over the centuries, right, next to every lighthouse, as ships are trying to come into harbor, around each one of those lighthouses are all of these upcroppings of rock, of jagged rocks, of stormy and rough surfs and seas. And after one, two, three ships started going down trying to get into harbor, they finally said, hey, we gotta get a lighthouse here. We gotta somehow direct these ships in. Now, place yourself as the captain of one of those ships. How did you get your ship safely into harbor? As you're coming through that dangerous spot, right? It wasn't by you going, oh my goodness, there's a rock, I see rock, steer this way. Oh, wave coming this way, steer that way. Oh, another rock, turn that way. You crash your ship every time if you did that. You never looked at your dangers to get to safety. The way in which you guided your ship to safety wasn't observing and avoiding the dangers all around you. It was one simple thing. If I keep my bearing, as the chart tells me to, based on that light, I will avoid and escape dangers, not by focusing on them or trying to get away from them, but by keeping my eyes on the light. Our lives are no different, are they? We got jagged rocks all around us. We got danger all around us. We got danger inside of us. How do you get through a marriage in this world? How do you get your kids raised in this world? Where is this country heading? Look at all the temptations out there. Look at all the rocks, the surfs, the waves. They're hitting us left and right. What's going to be the answer? How do we survive? How does the church survive? A lot of us, you know what our solution is? I think I can handle that one. I think I can fix that one. If I can just manipulate that one a little bit, oh, I definitely need to avoid that. And we somehow think we're gonna make it. If that's the way you live your life, you're a shipwreck waiting to happen. Life never comes by avoiding the dangers. Jesus says, just look at me. There's only one thing that's needed. Look at me. 
One of the great things that's needed in our world is Christians behold what's happening all around us. Is it for us to go out and try to fix everything? The first thing that needs to happen is Christian, we've just got to keep our eyes on Jesus. How in the world can I parent my kids? How can I lead my marriage and my family? How can I teach a class? How can I take care of a, and lead a business if I'm not following the light myself? If my number one thing is not, I know where my bearing is and I can keep others around me as I keep my eyes on him, as I keep my eyes on the light. What's kind of shocking when you read through the book of Numbers, most of us have never made it, right? It's difficult reading. There's one whole chapter in there and the whole chapter is, don't take your eyes off the big flaming fireball leading you everywhere. That's like chapter 14, that's the whole thing, right? It's just one, I don't know why they needed that much instruction, but I guess they kept being tempted like we are to, uh, that light hadn't moved in a while. I know it's a big flaming fireball. It hadn't moved, so I guess we maybe need to do it, things ourselves. No, God says, uh-uh, one thing's needed. You keep your eyes on that. I'll take care of every battle. I'll take care of every danger. I'll take care of every storm. You let me handle all of that. You keep your eyes on me. That's what it means to follow Jesus as the light of the world. Again, you think about the visual picture God's people in the Old Testament had, that huge flame of fire. There's a second thing that fire did. It didn't just guide and direct them. It also protected them. Somehow I missed this growing up. I knew about the story of the, going through the Red Sea and all this. And we know about the pillar of fire separating the Egyptian army from the Hebrew people, right? You know that, right? The Egyptian army's coming down, they're trapped. Sea on here, most trained, well-armed army in the world heading straight for them. Pillar of fire moves around to protect them and separates them all through the night while God parts the Red Sea and the people get to safety. Protection. There's another part I somehow missed. It also says that in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire looked down on the Egyptian forces as they chased after the Hebrews and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogged their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily, and the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. The Lord fights for them against Egypt. The pillar of fire, it says, started making their chariot wheels fall off. Every bit of this whole episode in the Old Testament is the pillar of fire protecting his people. Isn't that what light does for us? It protects us. I and mean, you're not going to go into any shopping center that doesn't have lights all over its parking lot, right? It wards off deeds of darkness, doesn't it? It keeps things safe. Why do you shine lights on your house and on your cars at night, right? To protect you, to guard you, to keep you safe. You know, our enemy, the devil... Remember what Martin Luther calls the devil in the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God? The Prince of Darkness. Y'all all know this verse, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. When do lions do all their hunting? It ain't at daytime. It's at night number of years ago I got to go on a mission trip to Africa and we had a free weekend and we got to go on a safari once in a lifetime kind of opportunity and on this safari they take you out at night if you want to see lions and it's called a night hunt you don't have rifles you just have a spotlight which isn't very comforting but you just have a spotlight but man do you see them those guides know exactly where they're going to be walking sneaking up on their prey they're at the advantage at night that's how Satan works isn't it he lurks in dark places. He tries to get us into darkness. That's why Jesus says, quit wandering away from me out of the light into darkness. John 3, the light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light that it may be clearly seen that his deeds are from God, oh Christian, in 2018, do we ever need to hear this message? The way technology advances in our world today, our world is eaten up with darkness. 
So many things are viewed and seen in dark places with no light anywhere to be found. There's a reason why pornography is having a field day in our world. There's a reason why statistics show that pornography is having a field day in our churches. Just two weeks ago, the men of every PCA church in Augusta got together for one conference on what's it mean to fight for sexual integrity and purity in this day and age, in this world. You better be fighting. Satan is seeking to devour. It blows my mind that parents will hand their kids a smartphone and just send them off to bed with access to anything they could ever want to view and somehow think that's going to turn out well, turn out okay. Satan lives in dark places and smartphones are full of dark places if we are not guarding ourselves and one another. Many lives have been ruined by not guarding our eyes. And many children's lives have been ruined by their parents who didn't guard their children's eyes. I remember one of the greatest gifts my dad ever gave me when I was a middle school boy was putting covenant eyes on every computer we had in our house. You want to talk about a, kid, a gift to a middle school kid. And deep down in my heart, I wasn't thinking, oh, I can't believe you took away my privacy. I was thinking to myself, thank you. Thank you, right? I don't think I ever told him that, right? These are things Christian parents, Christian leaders, Christian people, we must keep our lives, our families in the light. I don't care if you're 80 years old or four years old. Fools live in darkness. God's people live every aspect of their lives in the light. But it's not just sin. We've all got dark places in our hearts that are wounds, that are pain from our past that we go, if anyone ever knew this about me, if anyone ever found out about this, I'd be ruined. I'd be over. I'd be lost. What would my church think? Well, our second encounter we see when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, gives unbelievable hope if either of these are your situations. Because what we see is when Jesus shines his light into the dark places of your life, it is not to destroy you or shame you. It's to heal you. It's to free you. It's to redeem you. It's to set you free. We see this with the adulterous woman. You see, Jesus wasn't the only one with light back in his day and age, right? The Pharisees had their own little spotlights that they loved to shine around. And oh, if they could find anything about your life, oh, they're bringing you out. They're calling you out. Their spotlights were lights of shame and condemnation. We caught one. We caught her. Act of adultery. Let's bring her out. Let's shame her. Let's stone her. Pick up your stones. Let's go. Let's bring her to Jesus. See what he says. At this point, she's just a pawn in their game trying to trap Jesus. They have their light trying to find out what you're up to. But there's no redemptive ministry in their hearts about any of this. It's judgment. It's condemnation. And as this woman is brought before Jesus, I want you to ask yourself a question. You ever wondered why this lady had never come forward before for help? Why she'd never gone to her church or her pastors? These were her pastors. And the second they found it out, they were about to kill her. Of course she didn't come forward. She couldn't trust her church. they destroy her. What's so beautiful about this powerful passage is when they bring her to Jesus, Jesus asks the question you all know. He who's without sin, cast the first stone. Starts writing. If only we could know what was wretched in that dirt that day. Then he stands up. One after another starts walking away. Till only one was left. One who was without sin. One who could very well take up a stone and destroy this woman's life. He had every right to. She had sinned against him. And yet notice what Jesus says to this woman. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I can't imagine the expression and the emotion in these three words. No one, Lord, she replied. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and from now on sin no more then Jesus spoke again saying I am the light of the world one of the most amazing things to me about this whole passage 
is here's this woman and it's the worst day of her life come true. It's her greatest nightmares all happening right before her. All her deep dark secrets have been exposed. She's cast in front of her whole church. Here it all is. And her greatest fears, I'll be rejected, I'll be killed, I'll be stoned, no one will want me, I'll be left all by myself. And here's her worst, darkest day. Everything known about her. And Jesus doesn't go anywhere. Jesus doesn't leave her side. Jesus doesn't abandon her. Jesus doesn't leave her alone. Jesus now knows, and of course he always did, everything. And he comes to restore her. You see, what this woman didn't know is the horrible condemning light of the Pharisees, there was a brighter light, the light of forgiveness, the light of redemption, the light of healing, the light of hope, the light of peace that Jesus Christ brings into the dark places of our lives. This woman had no idea this was even possible. That's why she kept, hid, kept these things hidden for so long. It's why we keep our dark places hidden for so long. We're scared to death of light. Because all we've ever known our whole life is the light of condemnation and shame. We've never dreamed if light got into these places, I might be set free. I might be forgiven. I might experience hope. Now let's be honest. When light gets into your dark places, it's usually not a fun experience. It's painful. Not many people walk into the light willingly. I mean, as I look back over my life, there wasn't too many times where I willing, God many times dragged me, right? This woman wasn't willingly coming forward into the light. But oh, did Jesus rescue her. I'll never forget the statement of one of the men who shared at that conference just two weeks ago, a man who had been bound in addiction for decades, who stood up and in sharing his story, he said this, it is better to be dragged into the light, kicking and screaming, than to remain in the darkness and to willingly walk into the light is better still. First Prez, that's my question. What kind of lights are we shining around here? When light starts to expose the places that we all have deep in our hearts and lives and souls and families, what are we going to do with it? Can we handle it? Do we have condemning, shaming lights? Or do we have lights that lead people to the hope and redemption and salvation and the peace of Jesus? That's what you see here. This woman's worst day turns into her best and most glorious day. You know, one of the hardest things about being in a church is you look around and everybody's all dressed up and we all look good. And we, at least when we finally got out of the car, we quit yelling at each other and we walked in with smiles on our faces and everyone wonders, do they have any? They don't have issues. I, have, I wish I could share my issues, but they wouldn't understand. They wouldn't know. They don't have them. It just takes one person. One person. Raise your hand. Say, that's me. I need help. Watch the other hand start to come up. One of the greatest privileges is for me to get to go back and teach at Westminster over the last two years because I've got to see this happen. You know who's doing this? Westminster School students. I'm watching them share the most vulnerable places of their lives with each other and then I'm watching their response. I'm watching them rally around each other, give bear hugs. I saw one kid who shared something in class and in the middle of class, from the other side of the room, a kid not asked to do this, gets up, walks over, just hugs the person who had just shared something very vulnerable about their lives. That's what it looks like. We have these little small groups at Westminster and we have chapel sh speakers sharing all kinds of very personal things, right? A lot of adults who've gone through a lot of stuff in their past. And I got boys in my group going, man, that's me. Oh man, that's, it's amazing what happens. You start to raise your hands when you see you're, you're wounded, you're hurt, me too. And the light of healing starts to transform our lives. And what kind of healing? The type of healing like when a blind man turns to see. It's our last quick analogy. The disciples tried to turn this blind man into a theological point. Who do you think sinned that he's this way? Jesus says, uh-uh. This is all about my healing power to transform a dark light and bring it into the light. And you know what's the beautiful part when you read the whole chapter? This man sees. He goes back to church and guess what his pastors do to him? Who said you're allowed to see? Did he, he heal you on Sunday? I thought so. Is it Jesus? 
They excommunicate him for seeing. They literally kick him out of his church for being healed by Jesus. And so he goes back to Jesus and says, I don't know what else to do. And he falls on his feet and there's this beautiful conversation where the man is transformed and spiritually saved, not just visually saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. One last point as we close up. This is the only I am statement that isn't I am the light of the world. It's the only one that Jesus turns back around on us and says, you are the light of the world. It's the only one. As I have shined hope and healing and forgiveness and peace into your life, I now want you to turn around and take that light of hope to others around you. Imagine yourself on the Titanic. Icebergs hit, ship's going down. It's been a number of hours. At first, you didn't believe it was possible. They've actually already sent out all the lifeboats half full. All of a sudden, you realize the bows of this ship are completely flooded. It's now starting to tip up. And you know, you've, what other option do you got? You know, do I jump? Do I stay on? I know that water's freezing cold. I got minutes before I'm dead. And finally, you're so desperate, you jump. And you hit the water. And you're praying, you know, you got a minute, maybe two. And you give up to die. And all of a sudden, you feel something on your shirt. And it yanks you up. And it pulls you out of that water. And it pulls you in the boat. And they wrap warm blankets around you. And they start to take care of you. And all of a sudden, they turn to you. And they ask you one question. Are there any others out there? And you look back up at them and say, who cares? I'm safe. That's all that matters. Of course, you can't imagine giving that answer. But the point is this. The second you get rescued, you become a rescuer. The second God gives you healing and freedom and peace, he now sends you to be light, leading others to that same lighthouse, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one who can help and heal a dark and broken world. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for hope. We thank you for peace. We thank you for light. Every human being alive has dark places. Thank you that you penetrate our lives with your spotlight, not to destroy and not to shame, but to heal. And I pray that you would help us in this room to ask, who are the safe people in my church that I can go to, that I can invite in, that I can be vulnerable and real with and invite the light of others and of Christ? This isn't a battle we can just do by ourselves. Others must be present to help us. We're the body of Christ. Show us who those people are and help us in living out of victory and peace and hope. Through the light of Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
lift your hands to receive God's blessing and his benediction. May the grace and the healing, redeeming light of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, our Heavenly Father, may the fellowship and peace of God, the Holy Spirit, be upon us all now and forevermore. Amen.